I have spent the past 12 days in quarantine and I have a couple more to go. It's a little bit like being besieged and at the same point in time it's not quite the same. Here in the United States in recent times we don't know about the concept of being totally cut off as a city or as a state or as a country. There have been numerous times throughout history where cities and states and countries and groups of people have been totally cut off, completely surrounded by an enemy for a long period of time, preventing any goods from coming in and going out. Of course, when you're stuck at home and you can't go anywhere, and when you really feel terrible, because there was a period of time where I thought I was dying and I really did feel terrible. I was in a tremendous amount of pain and uh, the thing that's continuing on with that just is the feeling of being so very tired. But going without traveling anywhere for a week or two doesn't really seem like much of an inconvenience. Being in a sense shut up, not being able to do a lot for a period of now nearly nine months for many people is starting to weigh on a lot of people's nerves. But I want to talk to you a little bit about what the Bible says about some people who were besieged and maybe you'll get the idea that here as we're approaching Thanksgiving we can kind of be thankful that we really aren't in this same position as these people were. So if you want to take a look at your bulletin material, I'm going to be reading from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6, verses 24 through 30. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Now, if you would think of the lowest quality meat, and here you're talking about an ass's head, that would be something that would be forbidden to be eaten anyway. It was an unclean animal. But when people begin to starve and they're besieged and there has no, there's no trade coming in, they start eating their dogs, they eat their cats, they eat their horses. And here, if someone actually had the head of an ass that somebody might put in a big pot and boil it up in order to make some kind of soup, it was very valuable. Dove's dung, there's a debate as to whether or not that's actually dove's dung or whether it's the name of some kind of a plant. But a cab, I mean, just a small portion of a cab is a very small amount of food. So whether or not they were using doves, real dove's dung to, to, as a food to eat, or whether or not this was some kind of a plant that seems much more palatable if it was a nickname for a plant, you get the idea that people were starving, and if anybody had anything, it was worth a lot of money. Verse 26, And the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, and there called a woman unto him, saying, Help me, O Lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, whence can I help thee? Out of the barn floor, out of the wine press? The king was saying, I don't have anything either but what do you want? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and then we'll eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And then I said unto her the next day, Give your son and we'll eat him today. And she's hid her son. Can you imagine... 
it'd be a little bit like I have heard of, I have heard of somebody one time calling 911 because he said that his roommate had stolen his cocaine and it's one of those dumb criminal things. But here, here's a woman coming to the king saying, you need to talk to this woman over here because we ate my son yesterday and she's not going to let us eat her son today. She hit him and you need to have us eat her. Can you imagine how bad the king felt at that point in time? How horrible his country had fallen. How terrible the situation had gotten. You think things might be bad here in the United States? Probably none of you have actually considered the possibility of eating your child because everyone's starving. But that's what was happening at this point in time in this country that was besieged. In the future, it's hard to tell what might happen in any particular country as the economies of the world fall apart. And verse 30 says, it came to pass when the king heard the words, he tore his clothes. People passed by the wall, saw him dressed in sackcloth. In other words, he mourned for his country. I think you can be thankful at this Thanksgiving that we aren't living in those times, that we're not struggling like they were struggling. And if you know somebody who's struggling, who doesn't have anything to eat, who doesn't have any money to spend, who has no ability to provide for their family, then it's time for you to give. It's time for you to go out of your way to make sure that they've got it. You can pick up some kind of gift card. You can pick up something that they would be able to use. You can buy something and leave a bag of groceries that they're... You know who these people are. If there is anybody like that, Make sure that you are thankful enough to God for what you've been blessed with that you're willing to share at this point in time and be grateful to God that we are not in a situation like these people were in Samaria. So, next. Being besieged, that's one thing. But how about being quarantined? I mean, that's what I've been. Quarantined. Leviticus 13, 4 through 5. The priest was supposed to look at people's skin, and if the bright spot be white in the skin of his flesh, and the sight be not deeper than the skin, it's going through talking about how to tell whether or not somebody has leprosy and is getting any better or is getting worse. Therefore, it be not turned white. Then the priest shall shut him up, that hath the plague seven days. And the priest shall then look upon him on the seventh day, and behold, if the plague is in his sight, be at a stay, then he's supposed to shut him up for another seven days. I think that's very interesting because right now, here at a time when people have infections with the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 virus, people now call it covid COVID-19 is actually the disease that the virus produced, but it's easier to just call it COVID-19. But if people have the virus, how long are we supposed to stay quarantined? Two weeks here with this leprosy thing. How long were they supposed to be quarantined? For a week to be checked and then another week if they were doing better. Interesting. Two weeks seems to be the point in time that they were quarantined. Now, according to the book of Leviticus, 1346, all the days wherein their plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall be alone and without the camp. They knew at that point in time and long before that, that diseases spread from personal contact. And so you had to be quarantined. You had to stay outside the camp. You couldn't be with other people. You had to be separated, and that continued on into, even into Jesus' time, Luke 17, 12. As Jesus entered into a certain village, there met him. I'm having some trouble with my eyes focusing. Um, I don't know what's going to happen if I turn this light on. Yeah, that helps. One of the uh, 
problems I've had since I was infected was the fact that my eyes aren't focusing. Do I look okay in the camera? All right. At Jesus' time, it says, Jesus entered into a certain village, and there met him ten men that were lepers who stood afar off. They, had to, they could not even approach somebody else. And that's a problem today. In fact, sometimes it's even a problem here at church. Uh, the whole idea of staying outside. We stay outside and people are in their cars, but it defeats the purpose then if a whole bunch of other people get out of their cars and walk from car to car sticking their heads in to say hi to the people that are there. You know, that defeats the purpose. Here the purpose was you need to stay away and they were not even allowed to approach anyone. They stood afar off further than the six feet rule. They stood afar off. It's not fun being in quarantine. Be thankful. I'm thankful I'm a survivor. Be thankful if you're a survivor. Be thankful that you aren't sick. Be thankful that you're not infected, that your loved ones aren't infected. Be thankful to be on this side of the grass you have an opportunity to live. You have an opportunity to be used by God for a purpose. And pray for those people who are struggling with sickness and disease. I understand that in terms of the death rate of this infection, it may be fairly small. That still doesn't take away from the fact that more than a couple hundred thousand people are dead. I could have been one of them. Praise God, I'm grateful. I'm thankful this Thanksgiving to be on this side of the grass. Pray for those who are struggling and pray that you stay well and do whatever you need to do in order to stay well. Some other people are isolated. They're isolated in prison. Acts 16.9, a very interesting story from the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wanted to go preach in Asia. And whenever he wanted to go, it's like, okay, I want to go to preach in Asia and tell the people about Jesus, how Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He's risen from the dead. How, how I've had this encounter with him and I know that he's real and I want to get people converted in Asia. They need to hear the guy. And every time he'd get ready to go, it would just be wrong. The Spirit of God just would not let him go and preach the gospel to Asia. And so, Acts 16, 9 through 10 says, A vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately Paul endeavored to go to Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called for him to preach the gospel unto the people in Macedonia. And when he went to Macedonia, Acts 16, 13 through 15, let's start at 14, he met a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, in the city of Thyatira, who worshiped God. And he heard, she heard Paul. Her heart was opened. The Lord opened it. And she attended unto the things that Paul spoke. In verse 13 says, when she was baptized and her whole household, they started a church there. What a miraculous thing. Instead of going to Asia and starting to do a work there that the Holy Spirit wasn't behind, Paul follows this vision, goes to Macedonia, meets Lydia, she believes, and she gets saved, she gets baptized, her whole household gets saved, and they start a church there, which is really quite amazing. But then, of course, Acts 16, 20 through 23, Paul was brought to the magistrate by people saying, Paul and his group, these men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against Paul, and the magistrates tore their clothes and commanded that Paul and his troop be beaten. 
And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them in the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Praise God. I go, do what the Lord says. I want to go over here, but no. The Lord calls me over here, and yes, something good starts to happen, and now I end up in prison, beaten up, and thrown in the deepest, darkest dungeon. And thank you, Lord. That's how you feel. But that's not what Paul did. He really did thank God. He really did praise the Lord. And even in his darkest hour and in his circumstances, he trusted God and he thanked God and he was grateful for the fact that the Lord was willing to use him regardless of the repercussions that came as a result of being used. Sometimes you got to thank God in your circumstances. Not necessarily for them. It's not like, oh, praise God, I'm so glad that I caught this terrible virus and felt like I was dying. But praise God that in spite of the fact that I caught this terrible virus and felt like I was dying, I'm a survivor. The Spirit of God was with me. The power of the Lord was upon me. People were praying for me. And I'm grateful for that fact, that the Lord never leaves me, never forsakes me, never gives up on me. And all I got to do is just go where he wants me to go, do what he wants me to do, instead of go where I want to go and do what I want to do. Because my way is not his way, and his way is the way of life and the way of truth and the way that brings success. So be thankful. Be thankful that the Holy Spirit calls you to do that which is right and listen. Another way to be isolated, separated, quarantined, to be apart from God. Boy, to be separated from God. That is perhaps the scariest thing to me that I could talk about. Separated from God. But separated from the world? That doesn't bother me. John 15, 19. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, and I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Romans 12, 2. Be not conformed to the world, but be as transformed by the renewing of your mind. And finally, concerning that, 1 John. This is a real tough verse. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Stop and think about those verses for a moment. There's so many wonderful things in the world. I really love the sunsets. I really love the sunrise. I still force myself to go out and be outside at sunrise and sunset Every day while I was sick, even though I didn't walk for a mile, I was there for a short time. And there's, there's such beauty to be seen. Uh, when the crescent moon was, was out and the stars were so bright, it was so beautiful. And at the same point in time, I'm being told by God to not love the things that are of the world. And let me try and Paint that picture for you for a second. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life are the things that are in the world that we're not supposed to be involved in. There's a movie um, that came out a number of years ago that had George Clooney in it. Um, it's, it was a fun show, a little bit violent, but it was fairly clean. and. Uh, it was called Tomorrowland. And in this movie, Tomorrowland, the one good thing that's really in it 
a couple different times they talk about how everybody has inside of them two wolves. And whichever one's going to dominate is the wolf that you feed. And that's really kind of true. You have inside of you a spiritual person that's there to be serving God, loving God, working for God, being used by God, being blessed by God. You've got this wonderful spirit inside of you through faith in Jesus Christ. The spirit has come to live inside of you and you want to feed it, focus on it, help it to grow, help yourself to be completely enveloped by and involved in that spirit. But if you feed the other one, that thing which is selfish and demanding and cruel and oriented only towards personal pleasure and achievement, if you feed that, then that's the trait that becomes dominant in you. It's actually pretty easy for you to recognize things of the world that are lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. They're the exact opposite things from the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. You can see it. And we're being warned that we need to be separated from the world. I know that it's really tough for some people right now because they can't party at the bar. Really tough for people because the clubs are closed. It's really hard for people. But partying at the bar and having the club be closed are not necessarily the things that would be a blessing of God. You see, that's where some people's focus is. We're supposed to allow that part of our lives that's all about personal pleasure to die away and allow that part of our lives that's all about love and faith and God and Jesus and the power of the Spirit and helping one another and caring about one another and serving the Lord, we're supposed to allow that part of our lives to grow. And how do you allow that to grow and the other to die? Don't feed the other one. Be separated from it. Don't be conformed to it. I can't help it. I'm a mutant. I know I'm a mutant. I can't help it. I'm weird. That's just the way it goes. I'd much rather be weird and separated from the world than to be of the world and loved by the world. Because to be of the world and loved by the world is the opposite of what God wants. I'd rather be separated from the world than separated from God. Revelation 16.2 the first went and poured out his vial, talking about an angel, upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men that had the mark of the beast and them that worshiped the image of the beast. There's coming a time when there's going to be a decision to be made. I personally doubt that what some people are saying in conspiracy theory that the vaccine for the virus is something that Christians shouldn't take. I seriously doubt that. There is something coming in the future that's going to be the mark of the beast that everyone's going to have in their hand or in their forehead that will allow people to buy and sell. And I find it interesting that everybody who gets that mark we just read is going to have a terrible sore develop around where that is. A grievous, painful sore. I don't know if that mark is going to be a computer chip. I think that it will be. I think it will be something that can be scanned. I think it's just around the corner. I recognize the fact that here right now, we're seeing the destruction of brick and mortar stores where everybody has to shop online. And only those people who have a good online presence are surviving. Only those restaurants that have a good online presence are able to do takeout for people and have people drive through and they can survive and thrive. But coming up, how are you going to pay for all that? With a chip in the hand 
And what's going to happen when they get it? It's going to be an allergic, grievous, infectious sore. It's going to point to those people who are not separate from the world, but have instead become separate from God. Revelation 2015. Whosoever was not found in the book of life, written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. There is a book, the Lamb's book of life, that contains the names of every single person who at any point in their time, in their lives, have truly believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and never given up that faith, regardless of what they have faced. My name's written there. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross, and has risen from the dead, if you've prayed and received him as your savior, if you've let God know that you believe he died for you, if you've made that commitment, your name is written there too. There's a time coming where those books are going to be opened. And all those people whose names aren't written there are going to be separated from God for all eternity. That's far worse than being besieged. It's far worse than being in quarantine. It's, it's far worse than anything that could ever happen because it's for all eternity. Hebrews 13, 12 through 14. Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go, therefore, to him without the camp, bearing his reproach for here we have no continuing city, but we find one that is yet to come. Jesus, like a leper, died outside the gate. Jesus, being hated by mankind, suffered outside the city. Jesus, being rejected as the Messiah, went to the cross there, and we bear that same reproach by separating ourselves out from the city, separating ourselves out from the world, joining him, rejected outside the camp because of our willingness to join him and our unwillingness to conform to the world. We don't fit in here. There was a pretty prolific song, songwriter by the name of Jim Reeves. He wrote, Take my hand, precious Lord. And he wrote, It is no secret what God can do. He also wrote a favorite song of mine that I don't think is quite as well known as the others, but it's actually one of my ultimate favorites. It's called, This World is Not My Home. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up beyond the blue. I don't know if you've heard that song, but it's the truth. When you become a Christian, we're supposed to die to self and be separated from the world. We're supposed to allow the Spirit of God to lead us into service and worship and value that goes far beyond any of these things that we have here in the, in the world. Every Thanksgiving, in every church all around, probably throughout much of the world, certainly here in the United States, where people really celebrate Thanksgiving. We all conclude with the fact that we have a lot to be thankful for. Well, the greatest thing to be thankful for is that God loved you enough to send Jesus to die on the cross in your place. Through faith in Him, you can start a new life. You can have forgiveness of sins. You can live for all eternity. You can say goodbye to this world that is not your home, and you can enter into a new one, in a new city, in a new family, for an eternal life of blessing and glory, all because of the love of God in Jesus Christ, who's risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Thankful? I'm thankful for that especially. Amen? Amen. If you've never prayed and received Jesus Christ as Savior, now's the time to do it. Just pray this prayer with me. And if you believe what you're saying with your mouth 
then God will hear your cry, he'll answer your prayers, he'll forgive your sins and give you a new life. Just pray and say, Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I know he died on the cross for me. I believe he came back from the dead. I pray you'd come into my life. Forgive my sins. I receive Jesus as my Savior. And I give my life to you. And thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.